Okay, let's get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Ashwin Venkatesh and I'm uh, the NANSIG Educational Lead. Uh, and welcome to uh, the fourth episode of NANSIG's new webinar series, Neurosurgical Career Insights, where we hope to provide medical students and junior doctors with an overview of what a career in neurosurgery entails. So previously, we've covered introductory talks on what is neurosurgery, the principles of neurosurgery. And we had our first subspecialty talk on pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, and you can find all of these on our YouTube channel. Today, um, we intend to explore in more depth the subspecialty of skull-based surgery. Um, and to that end, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Mr. Andrew Alalade, who is a consultant neurosurgeon based at the Royal Preston Hospital. Um, he completed his neurosurgical training in the London North Thames rotation at Queen Square and gained additional training uh, as a traveling fellow at the Weill Cornell uh, Medical College in New York um, before doing advanced subspecialty fellowships uh, based in Brisbane and also in Liverpool. He's an author of multiple book chapters and peer-reviewed publications and is also an inspiring surgical trainer and mentor. We're very grateful to Mr. Alalade for offering to speak to us today. So thanks everyone for joining um, and that's it from me. Over to you, Mr. Alalade. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ashwin. Thanks for the opportunity to um, um, talk to members of NANSIG and other people on the forum as well. Um, so I'm just gonna start off here by, um, well, I don't need to introduce myself because Ashwin has um, introduced already. Um, I'm just here to give an overview. This is only um, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to score-based neurosurgery. Um, but I hope that you would at least have a better picture of what it's all about um, at the end of uh, my presentation. I have tried to divide this into six different parts. So um, I'll be starting off with the management principles. I'll talk about the components of the score base, share some of the interesting case examples I've got over the years, talk about the evolution of score-based neurosurgery, um, key attributes of a score-based neurosurgeon, and then talk about uh, the training pathway and how to learn score base. I have put this picture here because I think score base training and score base overall is quite similar to life in the military. And I'll um, share a bit more on that with um, subsequent slides. So a lot of people, when you think about score base, people tend to focus on just the surgical aspects, but there's much more to just operating. Um, when you have a score-based patient, a lot goes into preparation. You've got to plan, you've got to practice, you've got to prepare. And just like the military, there's a bit of a recce, you know, a reconnaissance where you come together, you plan how you're going to go into enemy territory, how you're going to get the um, these people out, how you're going to, you know, whatever tasks you're up to. So there's a lot that's put into the surgical workup. If it's a pituitary lesion or if it's a lesion impinging on the visual pathway, you want to test the vision, you want to have baseline um, assessments done, formal visual assessments. If it's maybe a vestibular schwannoma, you want to have a baseline audiologic examination done. In some of the cases, you want to check the lower cranial nerves, check swallowing, if it's a pituitary lesion, you want to work closely with your endocrinologists and know what the baseline endocrinological status is. You also want to be fully aware of what the functional status is. Is the patient symptomatic or not? What's the prognosis? Is there family support? What's the occupation? Is this going to impact? Is the treatment going to impact on their occupation? And then treatment options. There are so many treatment options now. Um, some tumors, you don't necessarily have to do anything. A lot of score based lesions um, are benign lesions. You don't necessarily have to treat all of them, um, but then you have to watch them. Radiological monitoring is quite important. Um, surgery, we all know. In some cases, embolization, where you have to block off the blood vessels before surgery to minimize complications. And then Together with surgery, or even without some tumors, you might just treat with radiotherapy or even chemotherapy. Now, um, an MDT. This is quite integral to the management of score-based patients, multidisciplinary team approach, and 
the, I, I, it's something I'm going to keep saying throughout this presentation. Um, over the years from the literature, it started with oncological cases where it's been proven time and time over again that MDTs have helped in terms of improving the overall prognosis and same with score base. So major question asked is, can we improve the symptoms? I tell my patients that the main challenge for a neurosurgeon is I, well, as a surgeon, I want to make them better or at the very least, at least leave them as they are. Nobody wants to make them worse. And these are all factors um, taken into consideration. So it's a holistic assessment of the patient where everything is taken into consideration. The MDT, like I've put up there, includes the neurosurgeons, the ENT team. Um, you have neurophysiologists, ophthalmology, radiologists, radiation oncologists. You have other members of the healthcare team. Sometimes you even have the psychologists. You have the speech and language team. You have the dietitians. Sometimes you could have an audiologic rehab um, team member. You could have members of the vestibular rehabilitation team. You could even have a facial palsy physiotherapist, you know, particularly in cases that involve the cranial nerve seven and eight complex, like vestibular schwannomas. You also want to take time to do what we call a CTREP, you know, so a situation report. Um, what kind of follow up does the patient need? How often do I need to scan them? Um, will the tumor recall? What's the grade of the tumor? Um, and there has to be a good three-way communication between the patient, the surgeon, and the team at large. Now, like I alluded to earlier, I talked about there being a lot of similarities between score-based surgery and, you know, the military. So do I need to go to war? Do I even need to operate? How do I get into the enemy territory? How, what kind of surgical approach was the best surgical approach in getting to the tumor? Will I be able to get out gross total resection without causing any complications? Um, you've got to know your limits. So, you know, wave the flag if necessary, have a post-op plan. And like I mentioned earlier, a good follow-up plan in case of recurrence, will the patient need any adjuvant treatment like chemotherapy? or radiotherapy. You want to be sure of how you can navigate through the hurdles, good new anatomy knowledge, know your nerves, know your blood vessels. And there's a good focus on conceptualizing in a 3D manner, because even if you look at the tumor on a scan, when you're operating, there's gonna be the brain in the way, the blood vessels in the way, the nerves in the way, and you want to call as minimal damage as much as possible. The nerves, the blood vessels, and even the brain are quite important. So all these things are going to be in the way. And a lot of score-based tumors, um, to get to them, you would be in close proximity to some nerve, some artery, or even some vein. Um, vein of labe is something that a lot of score-based surgeons worry about. Um, and that's just to highlight the fact that even the veins are very important. So you want to be very careful not to injure any of these um, very important structures. And it's not just score base. Whilst you're focusing on the score base pathology, other aspects of neurosurgery are important. Sometimes the tumor might be so big or obstructing the CSF flow pathway that the patient has hydrocephalus. So sometimes you might have to put in a shunt before you operate. Um, some tumors like craniopharyngiomas are commonly found in kids. So there's an aspect of um, um, pediatrics neurosurgery. Um, neuro-oncology, there's a good overlap with meningiomas. Not all um, meningiomas are score-based meningiomas. And even trauma, sometimes you could have fractures through the score base and you also have to manage these patients. Pituitary, I'll still talk about over the next few slides. And cerebrovascular is very important because the blood supply to the tumor, there's some Blood, um, blood vessels in close proximity. You want to be very, very careful when you're operating on these tumors. So let's get to the components. So this is the base of the score. So taken off the lead of the calvarium and the score base is divided into three parts. There's the anterior score base, 
okay, with the sphenoid wing here. Just here is what we call the planum, and this is the tuberculum. So that's that's the region, that's the anterior score base. You have the middle cranial fossa, and in the middle of the middle cranial fossa, you have the cella tossica, which is where the pituitary sits. And then there's the um, posterior cranial fossa. Now, the posterior cranial fossa is actually the largest of the three, but it's the one that's also most sensitive to um, space occupying lesions because the brain stem sits in the middle, and any pressure, any mass effect on the brain stem can cause dire consequences. Starting off with the anterior skull base, what are the things that we see in the anterior skull base? You can see meningiomas. This is pretty much anything within here is pretty much described as like an olfactory group meningioma. You could have a sphenoid wing meningioma extending into um, this region or even an orbital meningioma. Head injuries, we tend to see a lot of patients with um, trauma through the, the floor of the skull base and that can involve the anterior cranial fossa. There's something called estesio neuroblastomas or olfactory neuroblastomas, which is a tumor of the olfactory nerve. And that involves um, a neurosurgeon as well as um, an ENT surgeon because it can extend into the sinuses. A lot of malignancies also involve the anterior skull base as well as infections. So you have infections tracking up from the nasal paranasal sinuses into the brain. So you could have an intracranial involvement of the infective process. Um, pituitary lesions, craniopharyngiomas, or rat case cleft cysts are also um, are tumors you can see in the um, cellar region or middle cranial fossa. Now, let's take a few minutes to talk about the pituitary lesions. I love to use this mnemonic, and I've used it for years now. I, I ask my registrars or my medical students, I'm like, um, what are the hormones secreted by the pituitary fossa? And it's quite easy to remember. There are four of them, the ones in red by the anterior pituitary, the ones in blue by the posterior pituitary. So GP flat or flat GP, you have the growth hormone, prolactin, FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH. Um, the hypothalamus is described as the master switchboard and um, the pituitary is what I describe as the major relay center. So it tends to control everything. So these hormones, pretty much a homostatic process, control everything from, um, you know, control from above, which is the hypothalamus. You can have pituitary apoplexies where the adenomas bleed. And in many cases, you have to operate on these patients on time because it could affect their vision. Craniopharyngiomas are also tumors that you find in the pituitary fossa or above the pituitary fossa. And these are um, tumors that are derived from the pituitary gland embryonic tissue. You also have rat case cleft cyst. They kind of contain mucin and they are derived from the, um, just in between the, the two parts of the gland from the rat case pouch. And then you can have meningiomas as well in this region. And this is what I was um, describing earlier, where the pituitary gland tends to affect everything. And patients can come up either, you know, acromegaly, Cushing's, but I'm sure you know that already. And those are the signs and symptoms that you tend to pick up. Here you can see how close they are to the visual pathway. So just here pushing on the optic chiasm. And patients tend to present typically with this kind of picture where they have bitemporal hemianopia. Now, not all pituitary tumors tend to be really big. There's a cutoff, one centimeter. If they're less than one centimeter, they're described as microadenomas. If they're bigger than one centimeter, they're described as macroadenomas. Macroadenomas are typically either non-functioning pituitary adenomas or prolactinomas, the really big ones. Um, and that's because non-functioning because they grow in size and nobody knows. Um, but prolactinomas are also very, can be very large. Um, and that's why it's good to work hand in hand or collaboratively with a good endocrinologist because sometimes if you have prolactinomas, you don't even need to go in and operate. Um, you can treat them with medications and the tumor resolves in size. So these are two um, patients that had 
over the last year or so. This was a lady who I um, operated on with ENT um, for a very small microadenoma, and that's because she had um, symptoms from a prolactinoma, which was refractory to all kinds of medications. They tried all kinds of medications. She was allergic to them, and we had to go in and operate, and then she got better. This is a patient who had an apoplectic event from a large macroadenoma. And you can see this is typically the setup in theater. You have an ENT and a neurosurgeon working on both sides. So it's a two-surgeon kind of forehand approach, binostral approach to the pituitary. This is a craniopharyngioma. Um, so craniopharyngioma, there's a bit of a bimodal distribution. You see them in, in pediatric patients, and you can also see them in adults above the age of 40. Um, so they, they, they're tumors that you can also operate on either through the nose or transcranially from the side of the, of the head. Now, moving to the lateral skull base. The lateral skull base tends to incorporate the middle and posterior cranial fossa and you have different tumors. Some of these tumors are rare, but we tend to see them. And that's one of the good things I love with skull base because there's such a significant variety um, to the pathologies that you see. So you have meningiomas that arise from the meninges. You have vestibular schwannomas that typically sit in the cerebellar pontan angle, you know, very close to the cranial now seven and eight. You have Ep um, epidermoid cysts, which um, arise from ectodermal cells and contain fluid, um, they contain keratin and even cholesterol. So when you go in, they kind of look like a candle wax type of tumor and they surround blood vessels, surround nerves. And a major problem with them is recurrence. Glomus tumors, also known as paragangliomas, and um, arise from the neural crest cells. And this has um, an important implication on the pre-operative and post-operative management, because sometimes they tend to have um, high blood pressure, the patients who um, typically would require maybe a stint in ICU and can be very vascular. Meningiomas we've talked about, chordomas are tumors that arrive um, embryologically from the notochordal cells. Um, cavernous sinus hemangiomas, very vascular tumors. You have to be very sure of what they are before you go in or do not even go in at all because they're very vascular and the morbidity and mortality rates associated with them are quite high. I've added here that hindbrained um, anomalies like Chiari malformations can also be included within skull based pathologies. And then we have some other um, less common ones as well. Neurovascular compression syndromes, um, that typically means you could have um, a blood vessel line or impinging on the nerves. So you have something like trigeminal neuralgia and you need a, a skull based approach to get to it and separate the nerve, um, separate the, the, the blood vessel from the nerve because this is what makes the patient symptomatic and put some Teflon to um, take away the blood vessel. Now, most of these tumors are longstanding and benign. But I use the word benign with caution because because of where they are, like craniopharyngiomas, for example, very close to the um, hypothalamus um, with very important structures all around, they're not as benign as, as people tend to describe them to be. Many of the tumors can be complex and challenging. There's a high risk of morbidity, mortality, and recurrence in some cases and multidisciplinary approach is key, like I said. Now, I just put this here as a bit of a, you know, a stop gap. These are a couple of celebrities here. There's Marco Follow, who was diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma um, about 20 years ago, and he did have a facial weakness for a couple of months afterwards. Not many people know that. Um, growing up in the 90s, there's the girl group the TLC, and t -Boz also had a vestibular schwannoma. Uh, there's Sue Perkins, who's a celebrity chef who was diagnosed with a pituitary tumor some years ago. So anybody can have a skull based tumor. Now, how do you get in? There are different ways of approaching the pathology. So you can either go in, depending on where the pathology is, you could go in through um, the front with a ventral, a ventral midline approach. Um, bifrontal transbasal, where you do an incision from here to here, 
and depending on how the size of the tumor is, or you could do a transphenoidal through the nose and come into the midline, or even an expanded endonasal for bigger lesions. You could come in from the side here via a frontotemporal or orbitozygomatic approach, or even a lateral supraorbital approach or a keyhole one just above, above the orbit. For middle fossa approaches, you could come in, you know, through the side or do a, an anterior petrosectomy or a kawasi or a subtemporal for, um, and one of the earlier slides I showed a tegment defect, you could repair that via a subtemporal approach. Pre-sigmoid, so the sigmoid sinus lies somewhere here, pre-sigmoid is slightly anterior to that. The pre-sigmoid, so you could do a posterior petrosectomy. These procedures are done with the ENT team because obviously you're going through the temporal bone and you could encounter the um, air canal. Translabyrinthine uh, approach, which is used for vestibular schwannomas, or even transortic or transcochlear for bigger lesions where a lot is drilled out. From the back, you could use um, the, the suboccipital approaches as the midline, midline suboccipital approaches, a far lateral or retrosigmoid from the side. So there are different ways of getting into um, the enemy territory, like I said, to get out the tumor. Now I'm just gonna share a few examples. So this is an olfactory group um, meningioma, um, and you can see pretty much where it is here, there were the, the, the carotids on both sides. To get to the tumor, I had to go from the side. Now, there are different ways of getting to this. Some people will say you could go in through the nose. Some people will say you could do a bifrontal. But I went in from the side because um, I reviewed this patient in clinic, and he was quite keen on um, retaining his sense of smell. And that's one thing. You have to have a very detailed chat with the patients, tell them about the different options, tell them about the different side effects, and decide on what you're going to do. There's also the supraorbital approach where you could do this just, and I, I, you know, going back to this, one could also have done it with a supraorbital. So just over the orbit, you creep under the, um, the brain, the frontal lobe, you get down to the tumor, drill down, um, maximize the opening and get down to the tumor and take the tumor out. Um, this was a supracellar meningioma, so a planar meningioma, and the patient had really good sphenoid sinus, so it was quite easy to get to and get the tumor out. Um, these patients tend to have, you know, one of the risks you have to explain to the patient is um, about CSF leak, and because they could look through the nose and you have to try your best to repair it. So this is pretty much a view through this is into the sphenoid sinus, so drilling of the sphenoid sinus. It's opened up, and then you use a punch, take out some bone, and at the end, you could see the tumor. This is the optic chiasm at the top. It's a real good display of um, anatomy, very beautiful pictures. Um, that's the tumor. You get the tumor out, and then you have to take a lot of um, time to repair. So this is some tensor, um, tensor fascia lata from the thigh, and then a nasoceptor flap, which is um, harvested by the ENT team and covered. Um, we use that to cover the defect. Um, this, is a, this is a meningioma. So a meningioma here, this was a lady I operated on a few um, months ago. Um, so she had a bit of proptosis, was referred by the ophthalmologist, there's a big meningioma. She had a lot of headaches, predominantly right-sided. And on one of the other scans, there was a bit of uncle herniation was pushing. Uh, we weren't really sure of what this, you know, it had some atypical features. So went in from the side and took, took out the tumor. Now the tumor was going into the orbit and we had to get that out as well. And this is a post-op scan where the tumor has been taken out. Sometimes, if it goes into the orbit, you could do a lateral um, orbital approach where we we'll make an incision there with the ophthalmology team. So there's a lot of team working and a lot of collaboration with score based procedures. So an incision was made by the ophthalmology team, um, did an osteotomy and took out the lateral orbital wall, um, which was put back after the tumor resection. And that's the tumor there. And it was taken out and the optic nerve was decompressed 
because the patient was beginning to um, have a visual impairment and that was the main objective of the surgery to decompress and try and restore vision. Sometimes you could have an esthesial neuroblastoma, tumors of the olfactory nerve, which come intracranially and also go into the sinuses. And this require um, a collaborative effort again, intracranially, from the neurosurgeons and through the nose to check for any parts that go into the sinuses, the paranasal sinuses. Um, yeah, this is a tumor that, and looking at this, I can remember when I got referred this lady, looking at the scan, um, I was already thinking, okay, it's in two parts. It's in two, two components of the skull base. It's in the middle cranial fossa. It's in the posterior cranial fossa. Um, there are several tumors that can do that, but because it was going through what we call the Meckel's cave, where you have the trigeminal nerve, my top differential was a trigeminal schwannoma. Um, and at the MDT, I can remember, uh, you know, there was a bit of a dilemma. Where should I approach this from? Should I come through the middle cranial fossa or should I go from the posterior cranial fossa? It's a good thing I had senior colleagues who advised me quite, you know, reasonably as well that, you know, you could do a middle cranial fossa um, extended approach. And I was able to get the tumor out just going from the middle cranial fossa, which I you know, retrospectively, I looked at and said was the best decision because it saved me from navigating through the seven and eight cranial nerves, um, which could have given her a deficit. And she was only in hospital for two days afterwards and went home. Um, this is another interesting case. So when I got referred this patient, this patient had, she had presented to her, her doctors with diplopia and a lot of headaches. So she had double vision and she's quite anxious prior to coming to clinic. Um, and that's why a good MDT is very helpful because I discussed this with the neuroradiologists and they, they, they brought up a couple of differentials. But one of the radiologists was like, oh, I think this is a cavernous sinus hemangioma. Um, and we did something called a red cell SPECT scan and it confirmed it was um, a cavernous sinus hemangioma and we referred her to um, the radiation oncologist. They gave her um, stereotactic radio surgery and she did better. Um, she's so happy now from a very anxious um, school teacher to a very, very happy patient. So we didn't even have to operate on her. And that's why it's very good to have good members of your team. So with the cavernous sinus hemangioma, the morbidity mortality figures are quite high if you operate on them surgically. Um, this was one of my, I probably think was my most challenging case over the last one year. Um, a gentleman with a large petroclival meningioma um, completely squashing the brainstem. You could see the brainstem at the back. He presented with some weakness and some vulva symptoms. Um, Multi-staged approach took a really long time. Um, the surgery was a really long one. Um, he had some cranial neuropathies afterwards and got weaker. Um, so sometimes you, you don't necessarily win with all these cases because they're very challenging. And as part of his preoperative workup, we had an angiogram to assess the tumor and um, know about the ang angio architecture, the blood supply. And I found this very helpful because here you can see it's supplied straight from the internal carotid artery. Um, here you can see it coming off the ascending pharyngeals. And these two top ones show the tumor blush and um, Many times I'm reliant on our neuroradiologist to help embolize those tumors. And over the year uh, or last year, I've started compiling my estimated blood loss um, data to see how much you know, blood loss I get with these tumors because it's quite helpful if you plan very well and very carefully. Sometimes you could have skull based tumors that are part of a syndromic um, condition. Now, the most popular one is neurofibromatosis type two. Um, but this patient was a patient with Bloom's syndrome. And in cases like this, you, you don't necessarily have to go after all the tumors. You just have to assess the patient very carefully and know where the symptomatic um, one is and go after the symptomatic one um, because you, there's no way you can get everything out with patients like this. Um, this is another meningioma. Um, it's a tentorial one. 
um, and this is pretty much below the tent on the right side. Now, what is very important here is that's the side of the dominant transverse sinus to the sigmoid. Um, so with this one, um, the plan was pretty much to go in kind of retrosigmoid and take out the tumor, taking into consideration the cranial nerves here, and there's going to be the trigeminal on there. So you have to take all these things into consideration. There's, 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 I always tell the patients that this is a big blood lake that you have to be very careful about before operating. Now, we'll talk about vestibular schwannomas for a minute, um, cerebral, um, cerebellopontine angle tumors. So here you have vestibular schwannomas. This is the cerebellopontine angle. Um, and you have vestibular schwannomas arising from either of the superior vestibular or inferior vestibular nerve. Now, this is a cross-section through the internal um, auditory canal, and that's how it's arranged. So you have the superior vestibular nerve, inferior vestibular nerve. They always say seven up, coca down. So you have the facial nerve on top, the coca nerve below. And that's why you have to be very careful when you're resecting these tumors, because one of the commonest adverse um, events that can occur during surgery or after surgery is having a facial weakness. And that can be very, very annoying to not just, you know, not just the surgeon, but more importantly to the patient, because cosmetically, um, nobody wants to have a facial weakness. And that's what makes vestibular schwannomas so challenging. Um, they've been described as the ice cream cone, um, and I've put a picture there, and that's a typical way of identifying a vestibular schwannoma. This makes it different from a meningioma because cerebellopontan angle lesions, 85% of them, of the pathology, tends to be vestibular schwannomas. Um, second to that would be um, meningiomas. Um, and one of the main differences is you don't have the ice cream cone appearance with meningiomas. You can see the canal there, and it's free. Um, of, of the meningioma. So you know this is a meningioma and you know this is a vestibular schwannoma. Now, vestibular schwannomas are one pathology that have really shown how well skull base has evolved over the years because several years ago, um, this was a dreaded um, territory for any skull base surgeon. It was known as the, it was known as the dark corridor. And when you look back in the literature, this is quite fascinating figures. So you look at this International Congress of Medicine that was um, that took place in London, 1913, and Victor Horsley, who was one of the pace setters in um, um, British neurosurgery, um, reported 10 deaths in 15 cases, a 67% mortality for uh, vestibular schwannomas. Um, Iselberg reported an even higher one. And then you had Cross, who reported even a much higher um, mortality figure. And the conference ended with just no prospect of better results in the future. The few patients who survived were pretty much badly crippled. But then over the years, you could see that the mortality figures have dropped significantly. And now it's pretty much less than 1%. And this is one of the reasons why um, the British Skull Base Society has very, there's, there's a lot of scrutiny looking at vestibular schwannomas. There's a national vestibular schwannoma audit. Um, so where everybody's numbers and figures are, are scrutinized regularly. So um, what are the things that affect this evolution? Um, so we still have to churn out good score based surgeons, uh, but EWTD has a B, uh, which is the walking time directive, which means that surgical trainees now spend less less time in um you know in theaters not like how it used to be, uh, and you still have you know surgery, surgery is all about apprenticeship doing cases, um so we need to keep your numbers up. You still have to make sure you do as as many cases as possible. Um, the all this technological. Um, innovations that have come up over the years and research. There's a lot more information regarding syndromic conditions. So things are changing and things are improving. And as school-based surgeons, we have to keep up with the times and make ourselves be, 
you know, as good as we possibly can to be able to provide good care for our patients. So over the years, um, when they started, when they regarded the cerebral pontan angle as the dark corridor, um, they didn't have microscopes at the time. Um, nowadays, we have really good, really good microscopes. We have neural navigation, which when I explain it to my patients, I always say it's a bit of a GPS system to know where I am, um, you know, in the, in the brain or in the score. Um, we're getting better MRI scans now. So from a 0 0.5 Tesla to a, one, um, a 3 Tesla to even now a 7 Tesla, we're seeing structures we couldn't see before. Um, angiograms were not around in those days. So now we have angiograms to know what blood vessel supplies, what we can block it off. Um, this is a hemostatic agent. This is Flosil. So you can use that to stop bleeding if you need to. Um, we have stereotactic radio surgery. Not all tumors have to be treated with surgery. Um, so uh, most tumors, um, if they're smaller than three centimeters, if they satisfy certain eligibility criteria, then you refer them for um, stereotactic radio surgery. Um, you don't necessarily have to operate on every, every tumor. You have to weigh the pros versus the cons for every treatment modality that you um, are going to be referring a patient for. Um, now, there was a landmark paper from Denmark, and Denmark, um, with a population of about five to six million, um, were, they have one center for their vestibular schwannomas, and they were keeping all their data from as far back as 1976. So a couple of years ago, um, they showed that about 45% of vestibular schwannomas, if you monitor them for about five years, do not even grow at all. So now it's helped skull-based surgeons all over the world to um, kind of revisit certain things about their skull-based management of patients, because if a tumor is not growing and it's small, then rather than even treat the tumor, um, you can just monitor and observe them. So six months in the first instance, and then annually at least for the first five years, and then you can space it out and increase the interval over time. Um, now, this was during my fellowship um, about three years ago. So it, it's quite amazing because this was 2017. And I can remember then there was um, a bit of e um, not, what am I saying? Um, VR in terms of surgical planning. And now, pretty much three years later, things have improved in leaps and bounds. They're much, much fancy equipment now and much more detailed software. And you can plan. So you can even plan everything and map out your surgical parts, you know, your surgical part, your approaches, even before you go in. This is a picture of an endoscope. And this is something known as a CUSA, which is a cavitronic ultrasonic aspirator, which helps you to eat into the tumor quite neatly um, without causing a lot of um, injury to, to blood vessels um, in and around the tumor. So things have really improved and we're grateful to um, the ever improving medical technology. It's a good time to be a surgeon and with you guys listening, I'm sure it's even going to be way, way better for any of you who wants to become a skull based um, surgeon. So what are the key attributes? A detailed knowledge of neuroanatomy is important. Like without knowing your neuroanatomy, um, there's just no way you can be a good score based surgeon. Um, it, and, and it's not just knowing the neuroanatomy, it's you have to be able to imagine things in 3D. And that's one thing I've learned from uh, my senior colleagues who've trained me over the years. Um, in fact, I, I know some very impressive colleagues who would even have a score, um, uh, like a, a score being brought into theatre just so that you could have that regular conceptualization in your head. You have to be patient. A lot of score-based lesions, no matter how long you're there operating, you can't tug on a, on, a, on a tumor, you can't pull on it because it might be attached to a blood vessel, it might be attached to a nerve. So it really teaches you to be very, very patient. Um, this is a picture of Christina Young, and I can't remember what it is. Christina Young, you, those of you who watch Grey's Anatomy, 
anatomy. Um, she she's a cardiothoracic surgeon, but I actually think she she her, her, her attributes fits more with that of a skull based um, surgeon. She wants to be in theater. She wants to be in theater for a really really long long time as well. Um, so I usually crack jokes that for skull based surgery you you need like a catheter or even an appy because sometimes you know you might be in theater for long, long hours, 10, 12, maybe even more, depending on what, what um, the cases are. Not all the time, but if you're going to think of any um, subspecialty with the newer surgery, where the, the specialists tend to be in theater for a long time, yeah, it's it's score based. Um, it's score based. Um, dealing with stressful situations, yep, you've got to learn to think on your feet, um, MDT collaborating, team working, have become very reliant on other team members and I'm so, so lucky to be part of a, a wonderful team. Um, and that really helps. You have to be a good communicator. Many patients come, um, they've got this big lesion in their head, um, but you have to be able to explain very well to them because the fact that you've got a big skull based tumor doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that's it your life has ended. You have to be able to explain in layman terms, reassure them, talk about the different treatment options. And a lot of patients have found out that the anxiety levels drop once they have seen you in clinic because all they want is someone who's knowledgeable, someone who knows about the pathology and someone who will be able to explain to them in a way that they can understand. Um, What's the training pathway? So I'll put the ideal because sometimes it might not be ideal. You start off with a foundation program. Um, you get into neurosurgery, run through ST1 to 8. Um, you CCT, um, score-based fellowships are quite important. And I can remember in, I think I was ST6 or so, I can remember listening to Professor King at a score-based um, conference um, and he spoke about how score based fellowships have become increasingly vital um, before you become a score based consultant um, and yeah and that's the way it is and just a few months down the line I went for um, I went to present something at the European Society of score based surgery and this took the whole Saturday the whole Saturday session where they were talking about how score based fellowships are definitely a must before you can become a consultant. So for score base, you definitely have to put the work in to become um, a score base expert. Um, how to learn to do score base? Yep, you have to do the procedures. You've got to do a fellowship. For me, when I was getting to the end of my training, I took some time off to um, also spend some time in the cadaveric lab um, because I, I believe that's quite important and that helped me quite a lot. Um, the mentors are quite important. Um, directly, indirectly, um, and more importantly, you need a mentor that really cares and is willing to show you the ropes and is willing to guide you, particularly in the early years. It's a lifelong learning thing. Um, it just doesn't stop. Um, there's no way you can say you know it all. At the end of my training, um, as a registrar, I thought I knew quite a lot of score base. And then I started my fellowships and I was like, wow, you know, it's like, I don't even know anything at all with score base, you know, because there was just so much more to learn. Um, simulation techniques, simulation systems are quite good. And especially where you can't get cadaveric lab experience, you know, you might have to make do with um, simulation stuff. Um, surgical videos, webinars are quite important. Uh, and I still you know, join as many as I can from time to time just to help me research. It's it's quite good to have up-to-date evidence, um, know what you're doing, um, discuss figures with your patients, with your team members, and patience. Patience is, is very important. Um, this was a paper from 2007, so this is quite some time ago. And I, I, I saved this because this really, really fascinated me um, uh, when I saw this because who, it says here, who is the score based surgeon of the future? And the three things that pointed out was you should have interchangeability for endoscopic or open surgery. So the ability to use the endoscope. The endoscope has come now as a good surgical adjunct um, to look, you know, even after you do a, a transcranial where you open up, you can inspect with your endoscope. And that's been incorporated, not just for just transphenoidal cases, but even lateral score based cases as well. Um, cerebrovascular microsurgical skills is quite important because many times you'll be in close proximity 
very important blood vessels. It could be the basilar, it could be the internal carotid. And you know that any injury to those blood vessels, apart from traumatizing you psychologically, would have a very, very significant impact on the patient. Um, so yes, you want to be very, very careful and you want to uh, have good microsurgical skills when you're dealing with the blood vessels of the brain. Um, and has, you know, I can't say this enough, you've got to work well with team members because many of these procedures would involve um, other surgical teams. So um, there's a quote here at the top. On, under pressure, you don't rise to the level of the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. And that's why we train so hard. And many times when I'm doing a really complex case, this always comes to mind. And that's why we train so hard in score base because it's, it's they just many times you're gonna be dealing with complex um, pathology. Um, I always, this is, this is probably, not probably, this is the, um, this is the best gift I've ever got from a patient or patient's relative. Um, this was a, a gentleman who came in, was losing vision. He had a pituitary tumor. This was um, during my fellowship in Australia. And um, I operated on him, took out his tumor and his six year old son um, gave me this um, very artistic, very beautiful, but I treasured it. It was a six year old boy and he was really happy that um, Dr. Andrew had made his dad uh, much better. So this is still something I keep and it reminds me of, you know, this one of the reasons why I, I, I'm doing score base. Um, wrapping up, I just want to, you know, um, share the acknowledgements with um, members of the team. These are um, people who have uh, my senior colleagues, I've got two senior colleagues there, two score base consultants. This is my team at Royal Preston. Um, we've got um, uh, ENT colleagues here, endocrinologists, um, even ophthalmology. Um, this is a neuroradiology colleague, a score based radiologist, and, and the MDT coordinator. There's no way we'll be able to provide this um, good care that we're providing without, without all these people, and most importantly, um, the score based patients. So I'll be wrapping up there. Um, that uh, Those are my contact details for anybody who wants to contact me and ask any questions. Um, and I'm sure we'll be asking um, some questions here today as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mr. Aladi. That was uh, such an inspiring talk and a, and a great overview of uh, skull-based neurosurgery.